Now, faith has various expressions, but here's one of the expressions of faith. Appropriation. Taking what has been provided. Now, look. Christ moved in. He is the inexhaustible bank account. So that when we see a picture that tempts us to think wrongly, we can say, Thy purity, Lord. And he frees us to look the other way and be free from it. As if you didn't see it. See, it's not a matter of, Thy purity. That's driving in the flesh. And it's not a matter of just saying, Thy purity. It's taking it. Thy purity, Lord. And he frees you. How about the irritating circumstance? Uh, Thy patience, Lord. And he, you're infused with the patience of Christ. To actually be able to smile at that situation that normally you'd have mm, about. <laughs> or the temptation to the sarcastic comment when somebody says something provoking. Thy love, Lord. I've had some scenarios in the last several months where I'm looking at somebody and I'm tempted to really condescend this unlovely person. And immediately, in the face of that temptation, the Lord has brought this truth to mind. And I, I remember times when I just said, oh, oh, thy love, Lord. And amazingly, the love of Christ changed my whole perspective toward that person. Now, friends, that's, that's true. That's, this is real. What we're talking about. You can appropriate Christ's divine ability, his victorious life, to counteract and overcome the flesh. That is how we deal with temptation that comes through apparent causes. Now, second category, non-apparent causes. Not every temptation has an apparent cause. Not every temptation is in the physical realm or the realm of the seen. These, then, would be direct attacks from the enemy in the unseen realm. Direct attacks from the powers of darkness to the soul. Primarily your mind and or your emotions. The Bible calls these, in Ephesians 6, fiery darts. For example, suppose you wake up in the morning... And the Lord is just meeting with you. You have a precious time meeting with the Lord through the Word. And in prayer, you commune with the living God. Boy, your heart is rejoicing as you go to work. And then about three hours later, it suddenly occurs to you, Man, do I ever feel discouraged. Now look, when that happens, stop and ask yourself, Is there an apparent cause for me to be tempted to discouragement? Oh yeah, I just got fired. (laughs) Okay, well, if that's the case, then apply the truth we just talked about. But if you're sitting there thinking, you know, there is no reason why I should feel discouraged right now. That's a fiery dart. Recognize it. It's as if Satan has taken that dart of discouragement and just flung it right into your emotions. Now, friends, that's in the spiritual realm. It's unseen, but it's real. Here's another example. I was preaching in Wyoming. There's a young man. Uh, his wife came every night that week. Man, they were just laughing it all up. Well, we had a gospel service on the final night. I was preaching on hell. Well, the next week I was two hours away in another town. This guy was coming Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night when he wasn't in his church. He was driving two hours each way to hear the messages again. It's just amazing. And he said to me the next week, he said, look. He said, on Friday night in that gospel service when you were preaching on hell, he said, I so wanted to hear everything that was said. He said, and yet in the middle of that message, he said, my mind was bombarded with vile thoughts. And he looked at me and just just in sincerity said, do you think the devil could have anything to do with that? Well, friends, let me ask you. He's sitting in a gospel service. The message is on hell. We're in the middle of the message and he intensely wants to hear. Is there an apparent cause for him to... Be bombarded with vile thoughts? No way. It's not like he's walking through the mall. Where there's junk everywhere. Whether the posters or the people. And that's why men need to get in and get out. As quick as you can. If you have to go at all. But the fact of the matter is, this guy wasn't walking through the mall. He's sitting in a gospel service. 
There's no apparent cause. What that is, is a fiery dart flung right into his mind. Now, the way you deal with this is a little bit different. You've got to catch this. This is wonderful. Based on the truth of Christ in you and the whole idea of walking in the Spirit and the Spirit for life, to counteract and overcome the world and the flesh in the realm of the seen, well, now, when we're walking with God, we can also realize we're in Christ. He's at the throne. In other words, we can appropriate Christ's divine authority to counterattack and overrule the enemy. Now, this is based on Ephesians chapter 1. That when the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead, he was seated at the right hand of the Father, at the throne on high. And we're told that he was seated, now get this, far above all principalities, all powers, authorities, and might and dominion and every name that is named. Friends, he was seated far above the enemy. And according to chapter 2, if you're a child of God, you have been raised with him. And verse 6, you are seated together with him in the heavenlies. And friends, the fact is, in the spirit dimension, the spirit realm knows no geographical boundaries. Let it sink in. It's not figurative that we're at the throne. It's literal. In the spirit realm, we are there. We are in Christ. And Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. He is at the throne. That's authority. Throne, rule, dominion, authority. And he sits far above. Get it? Not just above. He sits far above the enemy. And friends, when we walk in the flesh, we place ourselves under a defeated foe. Because the fact is, uh, Adam legally gave over authority to Satan when he yielded to him in the garden. But Christ legally regained the authority at the cross. And the fact of the matter is, as a child of God, when you walk in the flesh, you're placing yourself under an authority that's no longer an authority. He was defeated at the cross. What a tragedy. But when you walk in the Spirit... You can go beyond the truth of walking in the Spirit, Christ in you, to the other glorious truth, you in Christ. You can claim your position in Christ at the throne, far above the enemy. And based on that authority, uh, that authority, which is not ours, it's Christ, but we're in Christ and therefore it's ours. Because he's the head and we're the body, there is a union. And friends, based on that authority, we can appropriate Christ's divine authority to counterattack and overrule the enemy. And when I say counterattack, it's Ephesians 6, the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now look, it doesn't say deflect. If all you did was deflect fiery darts after a while, you'd be surrounded by fire. That shield of faith quenches them. It counterattacks. It puts them out. Hallelujah. And from the throne, we can overrule. Because in that realm, Satan is at a disadvantage. In fact, he has been utterly defeated. And if God's people will claim by faith, this is why you need to walk in the Spirit, will claim by faith their position in Christ at the throne. That authority can be accessed. And that authority over Satan can be manifested as you exercise the authority of Christ overruling the powers of darkness.